let's do the recording and let's do a share screen. Yeah. Good. Does it work? Yes, I think it does. Very good. So today uh, we're gonna have some sort of um, um, uh, multi-class. So I want to do three things today. So the first thing, uh, we should complete the discussion about the weak interaction that we, we had on, um, on Tuesday and specifically about the electroweak unification that we started. I don't think this should take us more than, uh, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes because we, we got the, the main points and, uh, and then uh, just to complete and wrap up everything. And then I want to give you a tutorial. Uh, the tutorial would be about Cherenkov radiation and about electromagnetic showers. Uh, but that should also not take uh, all of the time. And then uh, the last remaining of the time, then we'll go back to the lectures uh, from the tutorial. And then we'll discuss the, uh, we'll start the discussion about the Higgs mechanism or to be more, more precisely, it's called the brute angular angular Higgs uh, mechanism. So the plan for today is to start with a lecture, complete the, the topic, go to a tutorial, finish the tutorial and then go and, uh, with the remaining of the time for another lecture. Okay, so it's a bit, uh, you know, covering several topics today, but, uh, you know, we're sort of running out of time and there is no, I don't want to waste any time, right? So on Tuesday, last time, we spoke about the gauge symmetry of the, uh, of the weak interaction. We generally spoke about the Lagrangian of the weak interaction. So just as a quick recap, we did the weak interaction And then we spoke about the Lagrangian, where the Lagrangian has to contain the Lagrangian it has to contain terms which will look like J mu L W mu. L for the left-handed particle. This is a combination of a vector and axial vector. Uh, again, this is because that's what we see in experiment. Right? And then we wanted to have a gauge symmetry of the weak interaction. And for the gauge symmetry, um, we ended up that the Lagrangian would look something like that. G weak, the, the term, the relevant term in the Lagrangian. Uh, okay, now that I can simply write down the entire Lagrangian just to make sure that everything is aligned. So we have L is just sum over Q, psi bar L, I gamma mu D mu minus M Q for the, particle psi L minus one quarter of W mu nu W mu nu for W mu nu D mu W mu A minus D mu W mu A minus G weak W mu cross W nu and D is the covariant derivative is D mu minus I G weak tau dot w mu. And when we want to associate that with, um, uh, with real, the, the real particles that we see in nature, right? The w plus minus and the w3 bosons, we figure out that the interaction term right, we had half G weak neutrino E L, uh, gamma mu W mu three neutrino E L minus E left gamma mu W mu three E minus L plus uh, neutrino E left gamma mu W mu one minus I W mu two E minus left plus E minus left gamma mu w mu one plus i w mu two uh, neutrino e left. And so we see that there are two terms which couple the uh, electron and the neutrino. So these are the terms that we associate with the w plus minus. Right. 
right, so these are these two terms. And then we have other two terms, right? This W mu three, and uh, it's tempting at the first sight to associate this W mu three with the Z boson, but uh, this doesn't work because the W mu as we're seeing from here is only couples the left-handed electrons and the left-handed uh, neutrinos. Now the neutrinos, that's fine, but for the electrons, we know that they're um, you know, they're not necessarily eigenstates of the chiral uh, eigenstates, right? We also have right-handed uh, electrons. And we know that the Z boson also couples the um, you know, uh, right-handed electrons. So we cannot just uh, associate W mu3 to the Z. Rather, we have to be a little bit more, uh, more uh, sophisticated than that. And the idea came from uh, Sheldon Glashow back in 1961 who says, look, we have two neutral um, gauge bosons. One of them is the photon and one of them is the uh, W, uh, is the Z boson, right? And we have the W mu three, which came out naturally from the symmetry of the SU two, right? So let's try to couple them. And the way to couple them is to say that the electromagnetic uh, interaction is not uh, independent of the weak interaction, but let's merge them together into one a uh, big symmetry, which we call the electroweak interaction or electroweak symmetry or electroweak unification, right? You name it. And then rather than treating the, um, uh, you know, photon as an um, uh, fundamental particle, or sorry, not fundamental particle, it is fundamental, as a uh, eigenstate of the, of the system, um, let's assume that there is a system, where there is something which you know, another eigenstate, right? So it's not the A mu um, gauge boson, but another one to call a B mu uh, resulting from this, uh, what's called the hypercharge. <clears throat> and then the photon and the physical Z boson would be linear combinations of this W mu three and this uh, new field that is inducing, right? It's a B field, right? So, uh, <clears throat> Right. Uh, it says that the Z and A, right, these are the mediators, the neutral interactions. Are formed by a linear combination that mixes gauge bosons uh, of two gauge theories. Right? Um, so we have a U1 gauge symmetry uh, of the electromagnet of electromagnetism is being replaced by a U1 Y, again, local gauge symmetry what's known as a hypercharge. So Psi of x will transform as psi of x um, u x psi of x, which has this some um, new coupling constant, which we call g prime, and then y over two chi of x psi of x. That gives rise to a new field, b mu, and a new coupling constant, g prime. Right? G prime is a new coupling constant. And the uh, Y is called the hypercharge. Why is the hypercharge? <coughs> oh, 
called, to, to be more precise, it's called the weak hypercharge. So the gauge field uh, couples to the fermions uh, and the uh, weak hypercharge. Why? And the interaction term G prime Y over two gamma mu B mu psi. So it looks exactly the same as we had for the interaction term of the electromagnetic, right? You remember for EM, you had Q E gamma mu A mu psi. And here, rather than QE, we have G prime Y over two, right? And that means that, you know, the same way as we treated the, um, you know, electromagnetic charge by saying, okay, every, every fermion has some electric charge, right? Q plus or minus one or can be zero, right? So rather than that, we're saying that every fermion has carry some hypercharge, Y. Which we can't do what it is, it's gonna be more And then uh, with this additional term, right, the, the covariant derivative, d mu is now d mu plus i g weak tau dot double d mu, which we had previously, plus i g prime y over two b mu, right? And then we said that we can think of the photon and the Z boson as a linear combination of uh, this new um, uh, gauge boson B mu and the W mu three, which we got uh, from the structure of the weak interaction. Right? So we write down A mu to be plus B mu cosine theta weak plus W mu three sine that a week and Z mu to be minus B mu sine that a week plus W mu three cosine that a week. Where that a week is called the weak mixing angle and another name is the Weinberg angle. Now this is something which we can measure from the asymmetry, right? Um, uh, in the electron, um, uh, you know, uh, outgoing electron, uh, you know, the parity violation from the electrons as we discussed uh, two lectures ago, right? And then from that, we can find the fermionic currents. I think this is pretty much as far as we went to on Tuesday. So I have a quick before I proceed, I wanna ask you if you have any questions. Uh, I have, so uh, the B bosons do not interact with themselves, right? Uh, yeah, right. But the Ws do. Interact with themselves? Uh, I think you said that there are three W junctions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are three Ws, yes. So right. is that true for the W3 as well? Uh, I think uh, uh, it doesn't interact with itself. No, it does interact with the W1 and W2 because there is a cross product. Right, remember yeah. that uh, when we looked at the okay. structure constants, there is a cross product there because the structure constants are just the um, Levitz Evitas. Okay, so the photon does interact with the W1 and 2, which makes sense because they are charged, but not with the W3 or with itself. Right, 
Yeah. Actually, there is there is in this theory there is a term for for a photon to interact with itself. Yes. So no, so now I don't see where it comes from. Uh, okay. <laughs> let, okay. Let's discuss it. I I didn't plan to talk about that. Okay, I did, sure. I did so, prefer that, but there is there is a scattering of the photon with itself of this theory. Okay, so if if, if it's if it's not what you planned, then, then never mind. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you. Oh, also sorry, one more thing. Does the uh, the B does not interact with itself, and and with the W, B and W do they interact with each other? And I'm not sure. I don't want to just say, I think not, but I don't want to say something which is not sure. sure. <coughs> okay. So, sorry, this is something which I have checked. I cannot tell you off my hand. I'm working out for myself and I try to come back with an answer next week. Okay, if we believe this structure, then we can write down the fermionic currents, right, associated with these uh, uh, Bs and, uh, you know, um, associated with the photon and the Z boson, of course, right? And we have the J mu electromagnetic is J mu Y for the hypercharge, right? That's cosine theta weak plus J mu three. Um, sine theta weak, and the current for the Z boson minus J mu Y sine theta weak plus J mu three cosine theta weak, and the J mu three is exactly what we had here. Right, this is exactly this part of the interaction. Right. So J mu three um, is half G weak neutrino bar left gamma mu neutrino left minus E bar left gamma mu left. Right. This is exactly the fermionic current that is coupled to the W mu three that we have. Now the the fermionic current that couples to the B. Right. Again, this is a, a neutral one, so it just couples uh, the current of the left and right-handed neutrinos and electrons, and we can think of them as being uh, coupled separately. So we can write down the J mu uh, y to be one half G prime, and then y e left e bar left gamma mu e left uh, plus y e r right. I'm putting different couplings for each of the species. Uh, e bar right gamma mu e right plus y neutrino left neutrino bar left gamma mu neutrino left plus y neutrino right neutrino bar right gamma mu neutrino right right <laughs> and here right the y e l is the is the hypercharge you know the weak hypercharge of the left handed electron. Now we can actually find these hypercharges. It's, it's something which we can uh, derive by, again, the requirements, you know, again, from what we're seeing, that the photon couples equally to the left-handed electron and the right-handed electron, right? And it is not coupled at all to the neutrinos, right? So we can use, uh, we can use the observational facts Right, that uh, J mu electromagnetic is Q E E bar L gamma mu E L plus E bar gamma mu E R. 
right? And there's nothing with the neutrino because the neutrino does not couple to the photons. So just a zero. So if we are to, uh, for this model to work, then we require, right? So this is just equal to what is written up here, right? Which is J mu, uh, J mu left, uh, sorry, J mu L, J mu Y cosine theta week plus J mu three sine theta week. Require because that's what we see. <clears throat> so if we now collect all the terms for the left-handed and right-handed electrons and neutrinos, right? Then you know we just get the linear combinations so of collect terms. So for the left-handed electron, right, we have QE, which we have here, right? This should just be um, J, JY, right? JY is just half G prime YE left. Cosine theta week minus one half G week sine theta week. And for the neutrinos, we get a zero, just one half G prime Y neutrino left cosine theta week cosine theta week plus one half G week sine theta week. Right. For the right-handed particles, again, we have QE, and that's just the one half G prime Y E R and cosine get the weak. And for the neutrinos, the right-handed neutrinos, we get the zero, which is one half G prime Y neutrino R cosine get the weak. So now we have the coupling, the relation between the coupling E, right? And the couplings of the um, uh, weak interactions and the uh, you know, uh, G weak and G prime, and the, the coupling of the hypercharge, right? <clears throat> so basically, you know, the unknowns are G, G weak, G prime, and the Ys, right? The Y E L, Y E R. Right. The Y neutrinos, we don't need them. So we basically say that uh, you know, the combined gauge symmetry of the electroweak sector, um, U1 hypercharge Y and SU2L, we write it down as U1 Y times SU2L. Right. Uh, Now, since we want invariance, right, under both the U1Y and SU2L, then the weak hypercharge of the particles and the weak isospin doublet must be the same, right? So we must have, so for invariance, under local transformation, we must have that Y, electron is the same as Y neutrino left. Because otherwise, when we make the U1Y the U uh, gauge symmetry, then, then we get a, a phase difference between the two, uh, the two components of the duplet, right? So which will break the SU2L. Uh, so we can, so this is a requirement. Right, and now we can uh, write down or can express the weak hypercharge uh, of each fermion 
as a linear combination of the electromagnetic charge Q uh, and the third component of the weak isosphere. So we can express, one can express the weak hypercharge. Y as a linear combination. of Q and I3. Right, so I can simply write down Y is some alpha Q plus beta I3 weak. Now the chargers and the I3, right, the third component of the weak isospin, uh, of the left-handed electron and the left-handed neutrinos, right? So for the EL, we have Q is minus one and I three weak is minus one half, right? It's in the bottom part of the doublet. For the neutrino, right, it's Q is equal to zero and I three weak is plus one half, right? So that automatically gives us that the uh, Y neutrino left is plus half beta and Y electron left is minus alpha minus one half beta. And using the requirement that they're both equal, Right, that automatically gives that beta must be equal to minus alpha, which means that we can always write the white weak um, hypercharge as y is equal to two times q minus i three um, weak. The, the factor of two here is just um, uh, normalization; it's a convention. So we can use this convention basically alpha is minus beta is two and we get that y neutrino left is y electron left is a minus one. And once we know that, uh, we can plug it here. You know what is Y electron left, Y neutrino left. And you know what is Q, right? Just the minus one for the electrons. Then, <coughs> We get the relationship between the, the weak uh, and electromagnetic coupling in terms of the weak mixing angle. So that gives us that E is G weak sine theta weak. Okay. U is minus one for electrons. And similarly, we get that E is G prime cosine theta weak. So we managed to get a consistent, uh, you know, self consistent uh, relation, you know, within this framework of this unified electroweak model, um, you know, of the electro, electroweak interactions, right? We can express down the um, pure electromagnetic interaction and the weak interaction, right? In terms of these couplings, presumably basic coupling, right? The weak coupling constant, the electroweak um, right? coupling constant, G weak and G prime. And of course, this mixing angle. Which again, this mixing angle is something which you can measure. 
So basically this theory does give us a prediction of the couplings of the Z particle to the fermions, right? And again, something which we can validate. Now, the last thing I want to say about that, the last two things experimentally, a great measurement that we're going to say it's not just giving you that, it's giving you much more than that. Sine theta weight is 0 0.23. The actual number is 0 0.23146 plus minus 0 0.00012. And then we can also express the physical gauge bosons, right, in terms of the coupling constants. So we can write down using what we previously did, a mu as g prime w mu three plus g weak v mu divided by this normalized square root of g weak squared plus g prime squared. And the z is g weak w mu three minus g prime b mu again normalized square root of g weak squared plus g prime squared that's kind of a final uh, remark on that right we can make a table of the first generation uh, fermions so the fermion or fermionic field right uh, representation under su2 Uh, the position in the weak isosplin doublet, the charge and the hypercharge. So the neutrinos, left-handed neutrinos, right? The representation, it's a two, right? It's a doublet of the representation. I, I3 is plus one half, right? And they're in the upper part of the doublet. The charge is zero. And from what we just saw, the Y should be a minus one. For the left-handed electron, right? It is within the SU2 representation. So it's two. The I3, it's a minus half. It's in the lower part of the doublet. Charge is of course minus one. And so Y is a minus one as well, right? which we got from y equal to q twice q minus i three. Right, for the right-handed electron, I'm just skipping the right-handed neutrinos because we don't need them in the framework of the standard model. But they're not part of the representation, so they're a singlet of the SU2 representation, right? And because they're singlet, they're not interacting with the, with the um, uh, weak isospin. So I, I3 is a zero. Charge, of course, is minus one, and the Y is minus two. And if we look at the quarks, right, we have the up quark left. Again, it is part of the representation, so it's half. It's in the up part, so it's uh, one half. So it's two and a half. Charge is, of course, two thirds, and the Y would be a one third. For the down left, right? Again, it's part of the doublet, but then it's in the lower half. So it's a minus one half. Charge is of course minus one third, and so the Y would be a one third as well. And then for the right-handed quarks, right? Right-handed up quark, um, they do not participate in the weak interaction. So for SU2, they're just singlets, right? Singlet. Since they're not part of that and they uh, weak isospin is zero, right? Charge, of course, two thirds, and then the Y would just be four thirds. And then for the down quark, the right handed one, right? Again, it's a singlet of the representation. The IU3, because it's a thing that it, it's not participating, it's a zero. Then the Q is minus one third, and the Y would be a minus two thirds. Of course, this is for the first generation particles, but an identical table would be for the next generation fermions. Right? 
Now the gauge bosons, right? They don't participate in the U1, uh, U1Y symmetry, right? the gauge bosons. Right, do not participate in the U1 Y symmetry. And because they don't they don't participate, that means that they're hypercharged, right? They're just zero. Now we can still use the y's two q minus i uh, i three weak, right? And we know their electromagnetic charge, so we can deduce that the i three, right, it's going to be a plus one zero and a minus one. It's similar for the photon, like YB is I3 weak of B is zero. The same for the photon, there is no charge. All right. So kind of complete the picture. It's a bit confusing picture. I wouldn't say it's not. But when you think of it, there's not much more than a linear algebra and a brilliant idea. Right, which again, it, it goes back to the requirements to the it's a, uh, under under requirement. It goes back to the uh, <clears throat> uh, to the observational fact that the weak uh, interaction uh, interacts only with the left-handed particles, not the not the right-handed ones. Questions? Questions? No? No. Okay, then that concludes what I had to tell you about the weak interactions. And, and then I don't wanna waste time because you know we have this lecture and then next week, and then that's it. Um, and I, I want definitely to tell you about the Higgs, about the mechanism and then about the discovery of the Higgs and what it is and why people are so happy about it. Well, some people are happy about it. So, uh, but first thing first. So last time we, uh, so now I'm going to have a tutorial. So now it's a break, right? Let me take my break now. And now I'm having a tutorial. Last time we discussed particle detection, right? And energy loss, mainly by uh, ionization. And I want to continue the discussion of particle detectors because again, this is part of this uh, course. And I want to say a few more things which are of importance. Uh, one is called Cherenkov radiation and the second is uh, electromagnetic showers. Cherenkov, I'm always confused because you can write it, you know, it's a Russian guy. And in Russia, it's even like that, Cherenkov. But in most uh, textbooks, it will be CH. I prefer to use the Russian name. So it's Cherenkov radiation. and uh, electromagnetic showers. Right. So again, so last time, okay, so last time we discussed ionization, which is mainly relevant where the masses, <coughs> and the, the, this is the mainly the energy loss of particles whose masses are above the electron mass and below the, the nucleon mass, which is uh, most of them. So this is um, ionization, mainly 
relevant for m greater than m e and smaller than m nuclei. Now I want to speak about the theoretical radiation. So what it is? Right. So the idea is, uh, the physical idea is, is very simple, very interesting. And Cherenkov discovered that in the 30s. And I think actually it went, uh, the theory is actually going to Igor Tam and another Russian guy, which I at the moment forgot his name. And it goes as follows. Uh, when you have a charged particle, right, uh, which has some velocity V and it travels through a material, uh, and the material meaning that it has a refractive index, right, N, and what happens physically is that the atoms near the particle's path, right, they are excited, right, uh, to higher levels. And, and therefore they become polarized. And when they return to the ground state, right, they emit photons. Now, really, they create a destructive inter interference. And so we're not, we're not seeing any radiation, uh, which is emitted out of this material. Unless when the particle moves uh, at velocity, which is faster than the velocity of light in the material, right? So that means that the velocity of force is smaller than the velocity of light in the vacuum because nothing can travel than, nothing can travel faster than light in the vacuum. But remember that the velocity of light in, uh, in material is the velocity of light in vacuum divided by the refractive index n. So if V is of course more than C and greater than C prime, we is just C over N. This is the refractive index. Refractive index in the material. Right. Now, what would happen in that case is that these photons that are emitted by the particles that were excited by the yeah the particles that were excited, right? Then they will end up constructively, and that would lead to a coherent emission, and that emission is at a certain angle to the direction of the velocity of the particle, uh, and this effect is known as Cherenkov radiation. Following Cherenkov was the first to discover it. Now that's the cause of a blue light that, that uh, you might be seeing in nuclear reactors. I hope you don't look at, in, into nuclear reactors or anything like that. But uh, if you look at pictures of nuclear reactors, you're seeing this uh, shiny blue light. You know what I'm talking about? If you don't know what I'm talking about, Google trend of radiation, you're seeing this uh, shiny blue light. This is exactly the trend of radiation. All right, the picture is clear. So let me write it down just to have it written somewhere, right? So um, when a charge particle uh, travels through matter uh, with refractive index and the atoms near the particles path are excited to higher level and when returning uh, to the ground states Uh, the atoms uh, emit photons, right? They are generally, uh, they generally uh, destructive interfere, right? So no radiation comes out. A 
unless um, unless uh, v is greater than c prime c over n uh, and then smaller than speed of light of course and then um, the emitted photons add up constructively constructively right this is called the trend of radiation and uh, basically you can look like that right photon the travels when well, this is the direction of speed and then it uh, also time passes by in this direction right so first the photon is here the particle sorry not the photon right it's here it's here it's here it's here it's here, it here this time and then um, um, you know it uh, it interacts with matter and so that that produces photons and then the photons go with circles um, as the particle is here right they, they, they go with growing co continuously growing circles okay, I'm a bad drawer right so lead up to some radiation which we'll see in at some angle theta The direction of motion. So the first question is to find to calculate the direction, uh, the relation between the particle velocity and the radiation angle theta. So let's calculate the relation between uh, the velocity uh, particle. velocity v and the angle theta right so again let's let's assume that the particle moves in the z direction let's call this z and also this is time right time time flies by in this direction so uh, let's look at the situation at three different times right at t0 the particle was here at uh, let's say t0 plus delta t particle was here and at t0 plus 2 delta t the particle was here All right so this will be delta z1 this would be delta z2 and then there is some emission which will go in some direction r1 so let's call this delta r1 the angle theta this will be delta r2 this is the same theta so since the particle moves at velocity beta, right, so V is beta C, right, then we have the delta Z solution. Delta Z1, right, is delta Z2, is just beta C delta T. Right, now, the propagation of the emitted photons, right? What is delta R1? Right. When the particle reached this point, right? After two times delta T, the photon right, reached radius, which is what? What is the distance that the photon traveled? Let's say that the particle, when the particle was around here, right? It excited, it excited the, the particles in the material and they emitted a photon, right? Now the particle, our initial particle continued to move along the Z direction, right? Right. So after times two times Delta T, the photons that were emitted from here are now propagated here. What's the distance that the photon propagated? Uh, C over N times delta, uh, delta T. Very good, right? So delta R 
right? It's just C prime times two delta T, right? C prime is just C over N times two delta T. And similarly delta R2, right, is just C over N times delta T. Right, so cosine theta, right, is just delta R2 over delta Z2, right? Which is also, if you want, right, delta R1 over delta Z1 plus delta Z2, right, is um, C over N delta T divided by delta Z2, which is one over beta C delta T. So it's just one over beta N. Which means that the Cherenkov radiation is emitted only uh, for velocities which are greater than one over N. And is the refractive index? It's pretty simple, right? <clears throat> if we can actually measure this angle, um, that can tell us the velocity of the particle. All right. So measuring the angle, if we know what material we are we are discussing, right? So we know what is the refracting the um, index. Measuring theta give us uh, the velocity. Alternatively, right, if we know the mass, right, or if we know the momenta, right, so also since, right, P is just gamma beta M, if we know the momenta, we can tell the mass, right? So knowing the momenta, and sometimes we have particles, right, we can use this uh, Cherenkov detector, then the most known one you might have heard of is REACH. Our ICH right in, in CERN, right? <coughs> we're, we're looking for particles. We don't necessarily know what particles we're seeing, right? But if we have a, a way of measuring the momenta, um, then we can measure what is the velocity and we can measure the mass, right? Or the vice versa, right? If we know what, uh, what particle we're dealing with, then we can measure its um, its momenta. Now the energy loss, uh, so knowing the momenta, we, we can tell, we can tell the mass. The typical energy losses by Cherenkov radiation is much smaller compared to ionization. It's of the order of a uh, few percent. Energy loss by Cherenkov radiation is one to five percent of you know, compared to ionization. Okay, so I have a question which is pretty much straightforward. So consider a pion. Right? And pion is to remind you 140 MV. And cowan. And cowan is 490 MV. Right? That have energies or that move with energies right e of let's say 20 gv what is the requirement from the detector material so that we can only see Cherenkov radiation from the pions but not from the counts what is the requirement of the detector material So that only pions are 
will emit gerent of radiation. So the solution should be quite straightforward, right? The condition for emission of Schrenker radiation is that beta times n is greater than one. The conditions. Wow, that was cool. How did you do that? Okay. Forget it. Now we can calculate the velocity of each particle, right? So the velocity of each particle. Gamma is just E over M. Square root of one minus beta squared, which means that beta, which is square root one over gamma squared, is the square root of one minus M over E squared. So we end up that beta pi on is 0 0.99997. Roughly, and that of the count is 0 0.397. And then we have beta pi on n greater than one, and beta count n smaller than one. That means it imposes that the index of a fraction should be greater than 1.00003, but smaller than 1.0003. <laughs> so you can design a detector <clears throat> to actually see that. All right. Now, one more thing I wanted to tell you about this Schrenker relation. Uh, I'm not going to do the full calculation. There is no point, but you can find it in, uh, okay, not that many textbooks, but I'm pretty sure that you can find it. I don't remember the textbook that I took it from. Um, the number of photons in a Cherenkov radiation that is emitted per unit length with the wavelengths between lambda and lambda plus d lambda is given by the for following formula. So the number of photons emitted by, sorry, per unit length where I got it, there was no derivative with wavelengths. between lambda and lambda plus d lambda is dn over d lambda, a d lambda, total number, is two pi alpha z squared, a one minus one over beta squared n squared of lambda, d lambda over lambda squared which is approximately two pi alpha z squared over lambda squared sine squared theta d lambda. <clears throat> which means that if we want to have, uh, you know, photons in the visible range, right? Visible range is lambda between 400 and 700 nanometers in the visible range. Right. Lambda is greater than 400 nanometers 
that's more than 700 nanometers, right? Then the required length of the detector Uh, so then required uh, for a given, okay. Then the number of photons that will be emitted Uh, or uh, inside. A detector of length L is and total, well, just integral from zero to L, dx, and then integral or 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers, d lambda n of lambda, right? This is just two pi alpha z squared l times one minus one over beta squared n squared integral from 400 to 700 nanometer and d lambda over lambda squared is just two pi alpha z squared L one minus one over beta squared n squared one over 400 minus one over 700. So if I use parameters which are relevant for the ring detector, sorry, for the reach detector, which is uh, stands for ring imaging Cherenkov detector, which is in CERN. So for the reach RICH detector, Now that n is 1.0005, and if we want n total, let's say 25 foot on the list, then we end up that L should be greater than 54 centimeters. Now this refractive index, of course, is is uh, relevant for very uh, relativistic particles, right? It's uh, very close to the speed of light. There are other experiments, right, such as the Babar experiment. Just to give you the numbers, Babar experiment in CERN, they have a quartz detector. It uses quartz detector that. Uh, the N is 1.45, N is 1.45, and that means that one can measure particle with beta of uh, 0 0.97. That allows beta so 0 0.97. The size of the detector, by the way, is just five centimeters. The last point I want to mention, which I actually already mentioned it because that's the most cool one for me, is that this uh, dependence of one over lambda squared, which appears here. Uh, because this exactly means that there will be many more photons towards the blue region. Right? Because if I plot down right, lambda, the n, the lambda, Right, this is the blue region. And this is the blue region. And then next to it will be a green region. Next to it will be a yellow region. Next to it will be a red region. And we have this one over n dependence. A one over a lambda square dependence, right? One over lambda square dependence means that it, it took something like that. So you're gonna see many more photons uh, in the blue region that, that causes the blue light. 
that is a blue bright light that is typical for this uh, Cherenkov uh, radiation. Do I have it? Maybe I have it right here. Yeah, I do. That's a, that's a textbook in astrophysics, but you can actually see exactly. This was an illustration of that. Not sure where this picture was taken, what, what experiment this was taken. One of them. <clears throat> All right. Questions about that? Questions? Questions? Uh, one question. <coughs> yeah. Why does accelerating to these velocities cause the radiation to be constructive instead of destructive? Well, because the um, when it's faster than the speed of it, you know, it's like um, basically the equivalent of a shock wave that we have here. Like, you know, when you have a jet, an airplane that, that uh, goes through the atmosphere, right? If it goes above the speed of sound, right, the particles don't have time to tell each other that it's coming, right? So it just, uh, that caused this, uh, uh, you know, um, supersonic uh, boom, right? So it's exactly the same thing that you have here, right? It's the part, for the, let's say the particle, right? The particle is passing through a region. It excites the atoms in that region. They emit photons, but it travels faster than the photons because the photons travel at the speed of light in the region, right? So, you know, when it reaches here, Right, the photons did not yet have time. It, it, it's it's um, it passed the photons, right? So the photons don't know that it excites it excites um, atoms here. The photons the, the photons that are emitted here they don't know anything about the photons that are already propagating. Right, so it's it's the equivalent of this um, you know supersonic boom that you hear when a, when a jet is uh, crossing uh, uh, the speed of sound. Okay, did I give you, is it, is the explanation clear? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Asaf, yeah. they call this development assume that uh, there is no any reflection of the particles because you go just along the Z direction. Yes. Any justification for that? Yeah, the velocity normally is so, um, yeah. When you go to relativistic uh, speeds, we didn't touch upon that because that's part of things you learn in quantum field theory. The cross section for interactions go down, it drops. Of course, if, if the particle interact with, uh, as the particle loses energy and interact with the particle in the material, this no longer holds because then it will also lose energy and go below the speed of light in main matter, right? So this of course holds only as long as the particle is uh, not interacting with the particles in matter directly. But this is, uh, happens all the time because the cross section goes down with energy. Okay, this is something which uh, is being taught in, uh, I don't even know if it's in the first course in quantum field theory or in the second course, but it's something that is taught somewhere along the line. How to calculate the cross sections. But in spite of that, it excited the atoms. Yes. So it did have, uh, it excited the atoms, but it was not enough to change its, uh, its momentum or, you know, not significantly change its momentum. Of course, there is some exchange, but I said that the energy exchange of the photo of the particle here is extremely small. It's just a few percent of the energy change in, um, you know, in ionization. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, then the second topic that I wanted to sort of have for, just go through quite quickly, is called electromagnetic shower. So electromagnetic shower, this is also a phenomenon that is extremely important, both in particle physics and in astrophysics. We have a lot of detectors that are based on that. Why, why do you do that? Electromagnetic 
shower. Right. Uh, again, this is a phenomena that again that occurs when an uh, energetic particle. Uh, actually, this connects quite nicely to the question you just asked me. Uh, when a particle, uh, energetic particle, right, typically electron or a photon, uh, travels through material, so certain materials, but now it is interacting with the particles, right? So it basically gives energy to the particles and produces, let's say, from a single single particle, it produces uh, two particles, right? And each one of them is still energetic enough to produce two particles each, right? Uh, basically, the idea is that every particle that uh, interacts with, you know, atoms in the in the detector, right, creates new particles and and more than one, right? Uh, until eventually all the energy is being left uh, to particles in the detector, right? So that ends up with a cascade, right? So what's what's called as a shower, right? The, the small picture would be that, you know, a particle lose and then it interacts with particles. So it produces, let's say, a particle or an electron and a photon, but this is also energetic enough so it will produce also, you know, electron and a photon. And this one also would produce, you know, it could be a pair of electron, positron, Right, and each one of them can produce an electron and positron. Right. And whatever, uh, photon and electron. I mean, you got the idea. Positron and a photon. You got the idea. So, you know, the first interaction would produce, you start from a single particle, then you produce two, you produce four, you produce eight. So you produce, uh, you know, you multiply the number of particles. Of course, uh, each one has half the energy. Eventually, all the energy is being transferred to, to the particles inside the detector, and that's what you see. So the idea is that uh, when when passing through the detector or through the material, when the electron or photon right, uh, interacts with the atoms. Which creates new particles. Right? Until, until it leaves all of its uh, initial energy in the detector. It's called a cascade, right, or a shower uh, of particles, which is formed basically in the general direction of the initial particle. Right? It's called a cascade or a shower. Now, uh, okay, I won't go into the details of that. Actually, I do teach the details of that in a course in plasma physics. Uh, so for electrons and positrons, the dominant process of, uh, of uh, you know, energy loss is called Bremsstrahlung or free free emission uh, for E plus or E minus particles then the dominant energy loss is Bremsstrahlung. Yeah, it's a German name, Bremsstrahlung. Boom. Also called free free emission. The physics behind it is that you have an electron, which is a charged particle, and it passes through other charged particles, right? And so it is being affected by the Coulomb field of charged particles, right? So it's being accelerated slightly, right? So you have an electron. Right, and there is some, let's say, a proton or a nucleon, right? And so it's being accelerated. And as it's been accelerated, it changes, um, it changes, um, you know, acceleration changes its momentum, uh, and that causes uh, emission of a photon. So basically, <coughs> right, 
right let's it see be, it should be bended the other way should be bended the, well yeah that depends on the charge that you have there you're right you're right it should be bended the other way so if i have here a nucleon right let's say a proton it should be bended in this direction right this direction so there's an exchange of a photon and there's an exchange of a photon here Right. Doesn't have to because that depends on the charges that we have. But yeah. Okay, so this is called the Bremsstern. For the photons, then the dominant energy loss will be production of pairs, right? So you have a, a production of pairs. The nucleus, nucleus, right? We have a photon, and we could think of it like that. So the end result is that you start with the photon, and uh, you wind up with two pairs. Of course, this can only happen if the initial energy is greater than two times the mass of the electron, right? only if E initial is greater than two. I mean. But when we speak about electromagnetic showers, we talk about particles of much higher energies. Uh, now, typically, we say that the energy of the, of the initial particle, right, we call it uh, E is E0 times exponent of x minus x0. And x0 is the radiation length. So E is E0, particle energy, E but minus x over x0. x0 is known as the radiation length. Which is a function of the material, right? The atomic number of the material. But also of the density and the mass of the in incoming particle, right? And density and mass of the incoming particle. Yeah. So I took from the PDG, so for lead, x0 of lead is 6.37 grams per centimeter squared. Let me have this, I'll show you that in a second. So for photons, the radiation length is slightly larger. Uh, it's, it's nine over seven. So it's about 30% uh, larger compared to the electrons. Uh, okay, so the particle, uh, what did they say? Uh, of course, it loses the kinetic, it loses the kinetic energy, and then at a certain point, the energy becomes small, and the ionization and scattering process also become important. So when the energy drop, right, then the ionization and scattering becomes important. Right, so I put down a uh, bit from the particle data group. Let's move this one. There it is. Yeah, so I took it. This is from the PDG, which I just downloaded uh, just a few minutes before the uh, before the, the class. I, I went down to PDG to check. So this is, uh, if you see here, the fractional energy loss uh, per radiation length in the lead as a function of the electron or positron energies. Right. So you see that there are various uh, processes and you get the characteristic energy less, right? X zero to the minus one here. Right. Okay, so that's that's a 6.37 is roughly right, right this one, right? 
Let's see, I'll see minutes. Um, just, uh, yeah, and just the last thing is that the energy, oh, what did I do that? Um, yeah, so the energy in which the, ener the, the rate of energy loss to radiation is equal to the rate of energy loss to ionization is called the critical energy. So EC is the energy uh, in which the rate of energy loss to radiation is equal to the rate of energy loss uh, uh, to ionization. It's called the critical energy. This is typically the energy where you say that the the shower stops. This is uh, the shower goes down until this this energy. Uh, so if we take a simple model, we can calculate uh, how many generations the cascade will be. So let us calculate. Uh, when the cascade will end. All right. So, uh, under the following assumptions. Okay, so the assumptions we make are the most simplified ones. So we say that we have an electron and positron or a positron, right? We have energy E, which is greater than, than the critical energy. So E minus or E plus is E greater than the critical energy. Uh, they advance one, one radiation length and then they lose half of their energy by radiating to photons, right? Lose half of their energy. The photons uh, greater than C, two photons in one uh, radiation length. And then we said that uh, photons with E greater than EC, right, they uh, advance once with one radiation length and then they create pairs. Uh, advance one radiation length and, and create a pair, right? Of course, each one has half the photon energy. And when the electron or positron have energies which is less than the than the critical energy, then they stop radiating, right? and then they lose all the energy by scattering. Right? So when E is more than EC, no more radiation. Everything is lost to scattering. And we neglect ionization, right? Neglect. Basically, it's a very simple model. And uh, essentially what it says is that each radiation length, we're going to lose half of the energy, right? By producing twice the number of particles that we have. So what is the number of particles when the cascade ends, right? Uh, uh, so let's assume that the shower starts. So we start 
with the particle, with the single particle having energy E zero. Right. Then after n radiation lengths, right, you have two to the n particles. Right. Multi plus minus and photons in about the same numbers, right? Each have energy which is E0 over 2n, the power n. And so after n such um, rounds, right? So E n max just E0 over 2 to the power n max is just E critical which means that n max is just log of E0 over EC divided by log of 2. So the length of the shower is essentially going to be proportional to log of E0. Okay. I should just say, I should just mention to you, since I worked on that myself a little bit, uh, for the, high, the, the highest energy particles are not produced in, uh, in laboratories, right? The highest energy particles come in cosmic rays, right? And the problem is, it's not a problem, right? It's the highest energy, it's much, much greater than the energies that can be achieved by man. But then of course the problem is that we don't know where they come from and the flux is very, very so, so the way to the dam, does anybody have a clue? Any, any clue? What is the detector that is being used to detect the high, high energy cosmic rays? Are these bubble chambers today? No. Ice cube? Ice cube is not for cosmic rays, it's for neutrinos. It's a different type of detector. So what you do basically you're using the atmosphere, right? And you're doing basically two things. So the, the, the biggest one is called the TA, the telescope array and the PAO or the Roger, Auger detector, it's worth looking at. They let the air shower develop in the atmosphere. So the particles that migrate go through the atmosphere, they interact with the nitrogen atoms in the atmosphere and they serve as essentially. They're losing the energy and they, they end up with muons and the muons are being collected on uh, essentially tanks of water, uh, which are held in some fields in Argentina. <laughs> they expand like, uh, I don't know, a size which is uh, uh, up the size of the state of Israel, give or take. Um, and they're just uh, collecting muons via the chunk of radiation. That's one detector. And the second one is uh, just looking at the sky in the dark, in the dark night, you can see flashes which originate from the um, uh, ionization of the, uh, the nitrogen in the atmosphere. They have these two types of detectors, and from that they go back and retrieve back how the shower looks like. Now I strongly recommend that you go back, just Google, call it Auger. Been operating for you know, 15 years now, maybe something like that. And I think that it's mainly <laughs> tanks which are being tanks full of water which are put in uh, some deserted uh, field in Argentina. Well, it's not exactly a field, right? It's somewhere in the Andes, which is extends like a 
kilometers over kilometers away. So just Google it. It's just quite fun. And that's how the highest energy cosmic rays are being detected. And we try to estimate what are the composition and energy, etc. Okay, you will get the uh, problems uh, to practice that a little bit. Any questions? I have a question about the theoretical radiation. Yeah. Uh, the formula you had with the one over lambda squared. Yeah. Is this a classical result? Ooh. Uh, no, you have alpha here. It's a fine structure constant, so it cannot be classical. Because uh, it seems to diverge as lambda goes to zero. That's true. Uh, and, and it seems to diverge just, just in the same way as classical models for black body radiation right, right. diverge as lambda goes to zero. You're right. Um, uh, no, I don't have an answer to you offhand. I have to you check out for one. What is the scale where this stops working? We, any way to estimate? I just, uh... No, I don't have it because if you look at the textbook, they give you the formula and they don't give you the full derivation. They just tell you the derivation was done by Eagle Tam and some other Russian guy, which I don't remember the name, sometimes during the 1930s. And it is actually quite surprising because I looked at the textbooks and I could not find the derivation of the formula. And I, I remember that I saw it, <laughs> but it was a long time ago. So I don't remember where did I see it. And uh, I have to go and search for it. It doesn't appear in any of the classical textbooks that I have seen. I'll have to go and check it out. It's so Frank Tam. What? It's Frank? It's Fra Frank. Frank Tam formula. Frank Tam? It's not equal. It's a different Tam? Or Frank no, is the other guy. Tam, yeah, Frank is the other guy. OK, that could be. I, I, remember, I, remember, I, I remember a general uh, Russian name, but maybe I'm, I'm confused. Ilya Mikhailovich Frank and Igor Yevgenievich <laughs> Tam. Igor Tam that I remember. The, the Frank uh, I did not remember. In any way, it follow it it it, it is under Cherenko. He got the glory for that. So no, I don't remember. You have to I have to check it out, or you can check it out. Uh, try try to figure it out online. All right, thanks. It seems to be something which is uh, you know everybody is using. So I guess these people have checked it. So. From Wikipedia, it seems to be classical because it uses classical uh, or or oh, relativistic. There, so I don't see how it can be classical. Uh, no, no, it uses. Uh, I mean, I uh, oh, I see what you mean. Um, it seems to use Maxwell equations. Maybe so not you know what, maybe. some quantized version of it, but I don't know. Maybe I I cannot answer to you because I just don't know the answer. I have to check it out. Thanks. Okay, but I, actually I tried to check out where how, where they derived this formula, but I, I could not find and I didn't have time to go through carefully. So, I mean, I guess if I were looking very carefully, you know, I have to spend more time, which I didn't have. <sighs> okay, that's about that. Any, any further questions? Just for the practical yeah. of the Bramstock formula, this is the way to produce x-ray, x-rays. Yeah, that's one of the ways to produce x-rays. Yeah, yeah, there is more than one way, but yeah. It depends on the system. Uh, a very efficient way of producing x-rays is the synchrotron uh, radiation, which I don't remember if we discussed or not. But that depends on the existence of a magnetic field. bram shalom does not depend on the existence of a magnetic field. So if you don't have a magnetic field, then yes, it's a very, very efficient way, you're right. Thank you for that. Any any further comments? Okay, well, we finished that. We did not start at the Higgs, which is bad because we only have two more lectures left and I don't think that's gonna be fully enough to cover everything about the Higgs. Maybe, but we have to stretch it a little bit. I'll just say, you know, kind of to give you a taste, right? Um, so, you know, we derived, we finished deriving today, discussing the weak interaction, right? And we derived the electroweak interaction, which was great. It was derived back in 1961. 
But remember that I said that we have a problem with the masses because they break the symmetry. So I just ignored the masses of the W and the Z and I said, let's talk about them later. But uh, you know, they still do have masses. And so we do have to find a way to give the masses. And uh, another thing which we saw is that, uh, you know, when I wrote down this table with the hypercharges, right, I saw that the left and right handed fermions have different uh, charges, right, both for the weak isospin and the hypercharge symmetry, right, which kind of makes sense because only the left handed fermions uh, interact with the, with the weak um, interactions and, and the right hands do not. But, um, you know, uh, that means that the fermion masses would also have to break down the gauge symmetry. And we know that fermions have masses, right? So we must find some mechanism, right? That, um, you know, would enable us to give masses without breaking the symmetries, right? We're still living with the symmetry. So the, the mechanism, uh, you know, we have, a, we have a gauge theory for the weak interaction, right? Uh, so the mechanism was proposed a few years later. So the, the, this, this whole weak interaction idea came up in 1961 and the Brut, and Higgs idea came in 1964 uh, with the idea of how the particles can gain masses by breaking the vacuum symmetry. Um, so the short, you know, it's the, the official one is the Brut, Engelt, uh, Higgs, BEH but uh, everybody calls it the Higgs mechanism. So we call it the Higgs mechanism. Um, it also gives masses to everything. So there was one poor que uh, question about uh, how you get masses. It's not, it's not only for the W and Z bosons. It's give masses to all the particles in the standard model, to all the fermions. I'm gonna show you how it's gonna work. Uh, and it was included uh, within the standard model in 1967. And Higgs itself, that's why he got the Nobel Prize, he showed that the mechanism requires the existence of a new particle, which is of course the Higgs boson. And we're going to discuss that. Um, now, another beautiful thing which we're gonna show is that it gives you also the masses of the W and Z bosons when it actually shows you what, are, what, what should be the ratio of these masses. They're not just randomly. There is a, a relation between them which follows, I'm gonna show you this, uh, a Weinberg angle or weak interaction angle. Uh, and this was way before the W and Z bosons were, were discovered. This was in the 60s and the W and Z bosons were discovered in the 1983, right? And uh, uh, by the, the super proton synchrotron experiment. So it was all, you know, everything we're talking about now was things that we, which were done in the 60s and really validated many years later, of course, the Higgs itself was discovered in 2012. So nearly 50 years after, uh, after it was first suggested. Um, and it requires the idea of a breaking, breaking of a symmetry, which means that there is some, uh, some symmetry of the physical system, which is hidden, which we don't see. It. Now, um, it's something which may look strange, but really it is not. Because when you think of it, you're seeing these examples uh, in many other branches of physics as well. Right? For example, right, if you are thinking of um, uh, you know, uh, solids right, or crystals, right? everything in crystals is due to Coulomb force. Right? And Coulomb force is symmetric, right? it has a spherical symmetry. But we very rarely see a crystal which has a spherical, a spherical uh, symmetric shape. Right, most of the crystals we see, they have some symmetry, but it's not spherical symmetry. Right, so there is something there that uh, that breaks the symmetry. Right, and the only way that we can see a symmetry is if we make experiments at energies which are high enough, you know, higher than the Rydberg energy. Right, uh, which is the ionization energy of the hydrogen atom. Um, so that's one example, and, and you know the same example you can think of a Newtonian force, right, which is the gravity, uh, which uh, says that everything should be round, but we know Earth is not round. Right? Some people even think it's flat. So you know uh, we have various examples of symmetry breaking uh, in nature. So it it sounds really strange at the beginning, but it really is there. 
And uh, what we're going to have is uh, Lagrangian, which is symmetric, but the ground state is not going to be um, uh, is not going to be symmetric. And that's asymmetry is what's going to introduce us with new particle. And we're going to see how that's going to work. But for that, we have to review a little bit more carefully about the basics of quantum field theory, and I don't want to do it right now because I think we're running out of time. So we're going to have an interesting week next week. And uh, I think that's it for now. Um, do you have any questions before we go? No? If not, then I'm going to tell you all uh, have a good weekend. Stay safe, stay, stay healthy. Hopefully healthier than I am. I'm a little bit sick for a few days. I hope I'll recover soon. And, uh, and I see you all uh, next week. You should get at a certain point today, if I can. If not, then tomorrow I'll post uh, another problem set. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. <clears throat> Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Thanks, everybody. And have a nice weekend and stay safe and healthy. And it's going to be now it's rainy around here. Should have a wet, uh, wet uh, week. All right. Bye bye. Thank you.